when I look at communities, like what's different about these communities? Most of the communities, they don't have a way of separating themselves. You know, if you talk to them, they, they'll they say, oh, we have very dedicated staff. Well, they're all saying that. Uh, our food's excellent. They're all going to say that. We have all these great programming. They're all going to say that. You should come see our beautiful building. They're all going to say that. They're going to say a lot of the same things, but there are only a handful right now that can say, and we have a one-on-one -on -one brain fitness program. And that's, you know, in the communities we're in, I always tell people, you need to tell them that, you know, because that's very unique, not only in the area, but across the state and across the country. There are a handful of companies doing this work. And I would tell you, there are many, probably more states than not, that have none of this work going on right now. Welcome to Aging in Style with me, Lori Williams. I'm an optimist by nature, and I believe you can follow your dreams at any age. My grandmother's journey with dementia ignited a passion in me to work with seniors. I've spent the past 13 years learning about seniors and aging. In my mid-50s, I followed my own dream and founded my company, where I use my expertise to help seniors locate housing and resources. On this podcast, we cover all aspects of aging. Join us each week to meet senior living experts and inspirational seniors who are following their dreams. The fact is, we're all aging, so why not do it in style? Hi, welcome to today's episode of Aging in Style. Today we're talking about dementia and brain health and things we can do to have a healthier brain. And so our guest today is Ron Nevelo. He is a licensed clinical social worker and certified dementia practitioner, and he works in the mental health field. He's worked in mental health for over a quarter of a century. He is a lifelong resident of Dallas, husband and father to three grown kids. Two of them are engaged. Congratulations. And Ron's work passion is developing new programming to serve others. His latest adventure is called Enlighten Senior Care. It's a mental health practice that works in senior living communities, providing on-site mental and brain health services. And Ron also has a private practice for individuals that's been active for over 20 years in North Dallas. And so when he's not working, Ron sings in an acapella group in a synagogue. He's the lead singer for the band Side Gig and an avid pickleball player. So welcome, Ron. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Sure. Okay. I have questions. Tell us about I hope Side so. Gig. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have lots of questions, but I want to know about your band. Tell me about your band. So let's start with the important stuff first, right? Yeah. So um, I've always wanted a band and uh, a friend of mine and I were watching a band one night and the next day started talking and we're like, why don't we do that? And it just kind of developed. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all the guys are actually in the acapella group I sing in also. And they have their own band, but we created this other band called Side Gig. We're a classic rock slash pop slash blues band. And uh, it's just a lot of fun. And so we perform wherever someone will have us. Someone <laughs> said, you know, why don't we bring you to one of our senior living communities? I'm like, I don't think the volume we play at is going to work for them. But, you know, other things might work, but not that. But we have a blast yeah. doing it. That's awesome. I love that. And then my other question for you is, what is pickleball? I hear that all the time and I have no idea what that is. <laughs> okay. So pickleball is the uh, hottest trend in sports. It really is. It's it is? Okay. Fastest growing sport uh, in the country, maybe in the world. I don't know. It's, it's really a big deal. And I got brought into it about four or five years ago. My wife was introduced to it by her tennis playing buddies, which is where a lot of people come from. And she played about a week and decided this is definitely for him, which she was right. And I mm -hmm. love it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a miniature game of tennis or a giant game of ping pong. I'm not sure which <laughs> would be more reflective. It mm -hmm. um, A lot of times they'll take a court. It's often played in doubles. I, don't, I really am not into the singles because I, I don't move that quick to do singles. So I play doubles and it's a very sociable game. People tend to change partners a lot in this game. And you use a paddle that looks like almost like a racquetball paddle kind of. I mean, it's that size. The ball is looks like a wiffle ball, uh, a plastic ball with holes in it. And it's a game played typically to 11 win by two. And it, it's just, it's very social. It's very fun. It, you get a nice workout, but it's not too taxing. Mm -hmm. And 
it's just a blast. It, it has nothing to do with pickles. I think <laughs> I got called pickleball because the, the game was created by two dads on vacation with their families. Their kids were driving them up a wall and they created a game on the fly. And one of the guy's dogs was named Pickle. And oh, so, okay. And they, so they named it Pickleball. Okay. It's so not, nothing to do with actual pickles. So I see it. All. At the YMCA and at the senior centers. So I keep hearing about it. So yeah, now I know. Have, you don't have to move that quick if you don't want to. Like with um, when you get older adults that just can't move as much, they could play against each other and it'd be a good game. When you get to people that can move, it gets to be a much more forceful, more of a workout type game. And um, fortunately, I'm still in that group. <laughs> 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 well, that's great. Well, thank you for, yeah, thanks for explaining that. Now I know what pickleball is and maybe I'll have to try it. Yes. <laughs> so tell me, I like to ask everyone this question, but what drew you into working in senior living and working with seniors? Um, that's a good question. You know, um, I worked in schools and high schools for about two decades and I kind of aged out of it. You know, like who wants to go to the old counselor guy to talk to? They want the young hip one. And I get that. So after a while, I just kind of aged out of it. And I was looking for something new and I came across an ad for a company that was looking to do work in senior living communities. And it looked interesting. And my wife kind of talked me into it. And I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to age out of this group. And then I started thinking about it. And it's like, this would probably be a really good move because business wise, this is, you know, the baby boomer generation has become the seniors now and they're moving into these. And it's like, it's probably going to be a good career move for me too. And being more comfortable as I'm now moving into that age group, um, I've become more comfortable with that group. And it turned out to be a great move for me. I really, I love working with these people and I'm meeting so many different interesting people. And there's a part of me that says, I wish I had done this a long time ago. Uh, but the reality is, you know, back when I was in my 20s and 30s, I wasn't that comfortable with that age group. And now I'm very comfortable with them. Yeah, that's great. Well, I want to talk about Enlighten and I know it's about brain fitness. So let's, let's kind of Let's talk about brain fitness. What is that exactly? So brain fitness, what we're talking about is what to do to get and keep a healthy brain. Uh, for some people, it's about how to prevent ever getting dementia. And if you get dementia, it's about how to slow it down. Um, but brain fitness, for the most part, is it's like physical fitness. You know, physical fitness is about getting your muscles in better shape. Brain fitness is about getting your brain in better shape. Excellent. Um, and I, I get this question all the time. I know you do as well, but what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Yeah, because it's so interesting. Um, there's so much confusion out there about that. Mm -hmm. So the best way, I, I'm going to use a metaphor to explain this. And I, I heard this once and I thought this is a really good way of explaining it. Um, Alzheimer's is to dementia like basketball or football is to sports. So dementia is an overall category. It's not even considered a disease. It's a syndrome. It's a multitude of possible symptoms. And based on what the symptoms are specifically puts into which category of disease you fit into. And Alzheimer's is the most prevalent one. That's why people oftentimes either think they're um, synonymous uh, or, or just don't understand that connection. So Alzheimer's is always dementia, but dementia is not always Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's makes up about, I've seen estimates anywhere from about 65 to 85% of dementia cases are Alzheimer's. That makes it the most prevalent. It, it's somewhere in that range, probably closer about 70, 75%. Okay. Yeah, that's that's good. That That's a good way to explain it. So I think um, I've heard it also like dementia is an umbrella and yeah. then all, everything falls underneath it. But, you know, both are good ways yeah. to explain it to people. So tell us about Enlighten. What what do you do? Tell us about your company. Okay. So uh, Enlighten is a mental health practice. And and I always I like to call it Enlighten instead of Enlighten Senior Care, because when they hear senior care, they think we're a home health group. We're not. We're a mental health practice. So it's a lot easier to just say Enlighten. <laughs> so Enlighten is a mental health practice, and we are focused on working with uh, older adults living in senior living communities. That's independent living, assisted living, and memory care communities primarily. And what we do is we offer any combination of three services. 
So one of the services is what we call professional emotional support. That's anyone that needs someone to talk to. They don't have a, necessarily a mental health issue, but they're having something they're struggling with, some adjustment. For instance, the person that moves into a senior living community for the first time and moves out of their home. And, and that, can be, that can be a tough transition because some people look at it and go, now my life's over, I'm moving it. And it's like, no, your life's not over at all, but they just need someone to help them with that transition. For some people, it's moving into a community and not knowing anyone. And, and it'll take them a while before they kind of find their niche in there. So until they do, who are they talking to about this transition? And that could be us. It's the person who is grieving you know, over a death of a loved one and needing someone to talk to. So there are a lot of different adjustment issues um, that can occur that you just need someone you're stressed out about it. You just need someone to talk to and that can be us or it could be everyday stressors, whatever it is. So that's professional emotional support. Um, a second thing we do is we're mental health practice. Of course, we do mental health counseling. So we work with people with typically with mood disorders. So that's going to be depression or anxiety are the two most prevalent in these communities that we're dealing with. Estimates are 20 to 25% of older adults have some type of depression or anxiety. So it's pretty common. And a lot of people are like, well, I'll just take a pill for it. And it's like, the research has been very clear for a long time that it's a combination of medication and talk therapy that's most effective. So we do the talk therapy piece. Now, those two things by themselves, you can find in a lot of um, senior communities, or it's pretty easy to find because mental health practices, there are a lot of them out there. They'll come to communities and do that stuff. It's the third thing we do that's really unique, and that's very rare to find. And that is we have a brain fitness program, a brain health program. So the brain fitness program is designed to identify people with a mild to moderate cognitive impairment or with dementia, but I'm going to talk to the mild, moderate part first. Mild, moderate impairment, that's a pre-dementia stage. Everyone at that age, their brain function is slowing a little. That's normal. The question is, is it within the norm for their age or is it out of the norm? If it's out of the norm, then we want to work with them and we want to um, try and get their brain in better shape. So it never gets worse and possibly gets better to where they get back into the norm, which is ideal, what we'd really rather it be. The other group is the people that already have dementia. And if you know about dementia, dementia is a progressive disease that is not curable. So there's no cure and it's going to get worse over time. And the only thing at this point that anyone knows how to do is to try and slow it down. So we have a program to try and slow down its progression. And so the brain fitness, we like calling it brain fitness, like physical fitness is used for, you know, to get your muscles in better shape, brain fitness, get your brain in better shape. That's awesome. What, what kind of things do you suggest to keep your brain fit? If you, you know, just have like the mild cognitive impairment, what do you suggest for people to do? Well, whether your brain is in good shape or it's got some level of impairment, even all the way to dementia, there are five proven ways currently that um, worldwide that have been shown to work to get and keep a healthier brain. And really, if you get something outside of the five, it, it may not be good information. I'm telling you right now, it's five. Uh, I did a lot of research on this. Then I took a course, a university course from a world-renowned research, brain research place, and they had the same five. And then uh, if you know Dr. Sanjay Gupta, you know, the doctor mm -hmm. to the stars, right? He, his most recent book is on brain health. And he did his research and guess how many things he found that are proved effective. It's the same five. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you right now, these are the five things. That, and if it's not in these five, it's not proven right now. So the five things in no particular order. Uh, number one is exercise, particularly aerobic exercise. Uh, most experts would say, 30 minutes a day, five days a week is ideal. I would say if you do it every day, be, that would be even better. But aerobic exercise is any exercise that keeps your heart in an accelerated level continuously. Like pickleball, for instance, is start, stop, start, stop, like tennis is or ping pong is. That's not aerobic. Uh, aerobic would be like walking. That's the number one, I would tell you, or swimming, uh, uh, jogging, anything that keeps your heart at an accelerated pace. So, for older adults, the ideal is walking. It mm -hmm. really is. And if they can get into a pool, then it's swimming. Um, but it's any type of movement. You know, for the person, for instance, that is uh, wheelchair bound, you know, they can't walk. So what are they going to do? And I'd say, 
for if you can work yourself up to 30 minutes, uh, move your arms, move your legs if you can, mm-hmm. because when you start moving your arms in a circular fashion or moving them around or whatever, your heart's going to go up. It's going to go faster than if you're just sitting there stationary. So um, that would be an aerobic exercise. So aerobic exercise. And in fact, most experts would say the number one, if they only had to pick one thing for brain health, it would probably be exercise if they could mm-hmm. only pick one. And all these communities have exercise mm-hmm. programs or opportunities to exercise. And that's a good thing. That's why they have that. Uh, a second thing, probably the most controversial on my list is um, social interaction. I say controversial because World Health Organization does not say it's um, a proven method. But on the other hand, most experts recognize that when you do multivariate analysis um, research, meaning when you look at multiple things to see at once what works and doesn't work, the group that has social interaction always is doing better brain health wise, always. And it makes sense to me in in real life um, because when you're interacting with people socially, you're using different uh, parts of your brain. You know, you're using processing speed and, and memory and focus. And so you're using a lot of different things that that's good for your brain. You know, you want to use it. And particularly when I go into senior living communities, I say, you know, even better is go, go interact with people you don't know as well. Go meet the new residents, go meet someone new, go attend a new event and meet someone new because talking to someone you don't know as well is always going to be more challenging than the person that you've been talking to and know everything about them. And I think you're you're spot on with the socialization because look what we saw with the shutdown with the pandemic. You know, so many seniors who really were stuck at home or stuck in, if they were in a community really couldn't socialize, and we've seen a lot of decline mentally with those people. Absolutely, absolutely. So you know, we see a real parallel there too. A third thing is um, what some are calling brain foods. So there are certain foods that when you eat them. Um, tend to be good for the brain. Now, the general rule is if it's good for the heart, it's good for the brain. So the easiest way to say what what foods for the brain, heart healthy. But in particular, I'll tell you based on the research that I've been reading, your number one food is, and most people would never guess this, is fresh blueberries. Really? Yes. Number one food, if I had to pick any of them based on the research I've been looking at and reading, is, is actually fresh blueberries. And I always have to tell people when I go into the communities and they educate older adults is, I don't want you going ordering blueberry pie and going, I'm getting my blueberries. <laughs> no, I'm talking about fresh blueberries. Uh, fresh strawberries, also excellent. Um, the other berries, not as much, but uh, uh, blueberries, strawberries, but particularly blueberries. Um, on the on the um, entree side, uh, number one, most people would know this is salmon. It's it's the uh, fatty fish, but, but salmon's better than tuna because tuna's got mercury and you can't eat too much of it. But even if not, salmon's really your best way of going. And all these communities are serving salmon all the time, which they should be. That's a yeah. good thing. Um, then you get into the uh, different vegetables, particularly um, broccoli. My mom wants everyone to eat their broccoli. Uh, I would never eat it, but you know, broccoli, <laughs> excellent food. And interestingly enough, in small amounts, dark chocolate has been shown to be good for the brain. And the most recent one I came across, which most people haven't heard of, is walnuts. Walnuts is being shown in current research to be good for short-term memory. So walnuts, if you like walnuts, start eating walnuts. But I like everything you listed I like. So that's going to be my new diet. (laughs) There you go. It's for the most part, you know, a lot of people say it's the Mediterranean diet. It's fresh fruits and vegetables. You know, do stick with that and you're, you're going to be in pretty good shape. And if you want beyond that, you know, uh, get some dark chocolate. That doesn't mean I want you to go buy the thin mint cookies right now that the Girl Scouts are selling. <laughs> but if you do, put them in the freezer before you eat them because they are so much better frozen. But maybe yes. one a day. But see, I could never eat one a day. Oh, I could I eat can't. a box a day, but I couldn't yeah. eat one a day. But dark chocolate, limited amounts, walnuts, blueberries, number one food. So that's brain foods. That's number three on our list. And most most of these communities have a lot of these foods or are serving these foods. The, the, the good ones are. So they're already doing exercise. They're offering social opportunities. And they are um, providing these foods. Now, the fourth one is what I call uh, keeping your body and brain in better shape. 
So it's physical and mental health, mostly physical health. If you ever see a list that's good, that says more than five things, like top 10 things or the 10 things to get a healthy brain, they've probably taken physical health and broken it into a lot of different components. So I'm grouping it. When I say five, I'm grouping it. So what are some of the individual components I'm talking about? Well, it means uh, getting enough sleep, particularly REM sleep, the deep sleep you get in at night. That's so much more important than overall time and sleep. Okay, so REM sleep is important. Keeping yourself hydrated, um, keeping your blood pressure in check, keeping your cholesterol down to, to the levels that are healthy. If you're diabetic, keeping your diabetes in check and treating that. Keeping your weight at a good weight um, is important. So when you see these broken down, they're probably going to talk about all these individual things, right? There's a lot to be said for mental health, that depression is going to make short-term memory and, and processing a lot more difficult as well and anxiety could also. You know, so there's a lot of research out there about that. So overall, physical, particularly, particularly physical, but mental health too, taking care of your health is a good thing. And for the most part, all these communities either provide the services on site or bring people in or give you transportation to get to them. So... When you're looking at the preventative things, and I said there are five things, um, we found that four of them were already being handled. It's the fifth one where Enlighten came in and, and we're trying to provide the fifth one that in most communities you're not going to see, and that's challenging cognitive activities. So by challenging cognitive activities, I'm talking about any type of activity you can do where you're utilizing the brain and really kind of uh, pushing it to work. Um, so a conversation I'm having with you is not a challenging activity. Like when I tell people when I'm lecturing, right? A lecture is a cognitive activity. I'm listening. I'm processing what you're telling me. You want to make it a challenging cognitive activity when you're talking that night or the next day about your the lecture. Tell them what you've learned. See, that's going to mm -hmm. be a challenging cognitive activity. You hear the difference there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's, it's trying to find activities that will really challenge you. And what we found is in most communities, they either don't have these activities or they're doing the wrong ones. Like the most common thing I find in independent living communities is crossword puzzles and word finds. But crossword puzzles and word finds are really long-term memory. And for the most part, independent living, those residents don't have an issue with long-term memory. Their issues with short-term memory, and yeah. those two things don't work on short-term memory. Plus, even places that have short-term memory type stuff activities, a lot of times they're group activities. They're not one-on-one. -on -one. They're not set up to do one-on-one -on -one stuff. So we're coming in to provide one-on-one -on -one challenging cognitive activities. So it's the challenging cognitive activities that's the other piece. What's an example of one of the activities that you do, a challenging mm -hmm. cognitive one? Well, um, we actually have a variety of different things that we could do. But one of the things I could do is, you know, particularly when people's like, if I'm not doing your program or if I don't have insurance to cover the program, what do you recommend? And, and my quick answer is learn anything new. Learning new things is going to challenge you cognitively. It just is. And it really doesn't matter. There's a lot of research out there on it. You know, there's research showing that learning how to knit is good for the brain or um, you know, learning digital photography is good for the brain. It's not the what you're learning. It's just learning new things. And what I tell uh, older adults is the number one thing I tell them to learn is a technology because mm -hmm. so many of them don't know it. And it's a whole world that will open up to it. Like, you know, when I tell people, I can teach you how to access your computer and get old Jack Benny episodes or mm -hmm. uh, Phil Silver show or listen to um, Bing Crosby in concert and watch him. And, and, yeah. and you can do all of that if you'll just let me teach you how to do this and you'll learn this, which is all YouTube, mm -hmm. right? All that stuff's on YouTube and they don't even know it. A lot of them don't know it. Or if they're really into news, the, the worldwide news is all over the place on the internet. Or mm -hmm. if they uh, always love the one time in their life they went to the Louvre, I'm like, well, you can go now, but you can go on the computer, right? And you, or you yeah. can go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, and you don't have to go to New York, you can go on the computer. Or you want to see the pandas in the uh, uh, zoo in Washington, D.C. You know, it, it, yeah, you can do that on the computer too. Let me show you all these things. So it's a whole world that a lot of them aren't opened up to uh, or ways of connecting to family or friends, particularly friends they haven't talked to forever. Mm -hmm. You can do that over you know, the internet. So it's opening up a whole new world. A second thing I love to tell people is learning or relearning a language. 
And a lot of people, the initial reaction is, uh, I don't want to <laughs> do that. I'm like, but think about what is it that you don't like when you think about learning a language? And I already know what it is because I think of it. I, I think of when I last learned a language. Well, what was different? Well, I had tests. I had a homework. I had a teacher telling me what to do. I didn't get to pick my language in a lot mm-hmm. of cases. I had parents getting on me if I didn't do my work. And why would I mm-hmm. want all of that now that I'm retired? Yeah. Right? And you're doing it because you had to do it. Now it's yeah. something but you see, wanted now to do. Now what I <laughs> offer is no, none of those things apply anymore. You pick the language. I'm going to give you a program that'll teach it to you. It'll be kind of fun, maybe too simple at times till you really get going on it. And you'll do as much or as little as you want. And if you don't do well, it doesn't matter. You're just challenging yourself. You just got to try. And if you bomb out on it, that's okay. I also really love because the website I give them to learn it on is uh, duolingo.com, which is one of a variety of different free online websites. But what's cool about it, one of the things I love about it is if you are a Star Trek fan, is one of the languages they offer is Klingon, which is a totally made up (laughs) language that was used in the Star Trek series, Mm -hmm. but they've created the language for you and they can teach you Klingon. And I said, you know, when I go into these senior (laughs) living communities, I'm like, you know, if you find another Star Trek fan, you two learn Klingon together. And then when you go to the dining room, talk in Klingon. No one will never, ever know what you're saying. That's hilarious. <laughs> Do you have any any of them learning Klingon yet? No, I haven't gotten <laughs> anyone to pick up on that yet. But, but I, I did. I found someone, uh, one of my clients once, I asked her, what she used to do. And she used to, when she went to college, she double majored in language. And then she was a translator when she got out. And I said, do you still speak them? She goes, no, no, not at all. And I said, do you miss them? And she said, I don't miss Spanish because I never liked it, but I miss, I miss French. And then having never spoken a French in my whole life or know anything about the language, I said, do you want to relearn it? And, And I just, connected her to Duolingo. It did it for me, you know? So Mm -hmm. in looking at one of the activities I did, I I, I pulled up Duolingo and I I ran the program for her while she was relearning French. That'd be an example of something I could do. There, There are a million things, like a simple thing I could do, and I actually did it yesterday, is do you ever remember the card game um, Concentration? Yes, I do. Okay. So I can take, instead of taking the whole deck, I'll take like eight pairs and shuffle them up, put them down. And the way you play concentration is you turn over two at a time. And if they match, you get them. And if they don't, you got to put them back down. And then you got to pick two new cards. And you're always trying to find a match. And the reason why concentration, it's also been called, the game's also been called memory, is Mm -hmm. you need to focus and memorize where the cards are. Because when I turn over, let's say, a king, and I've turned over a king before, I got to remember where the other king is. (laughs) Because you only get to turn over two at a time. So it's really a good Mm -hmm. activity or game that will really challenge you. It's a challenging cognitive activity. Yeah. I need to start doing that. (laughs) And when I do it with people, I don't play against them. I just have them play with themselves. That's why, you know, mattering how much their ability is, is how many pairs I could give them. Mm -hmm. That's great. So how do people pay for this service? Is it covered by Medicare? Excellent question. So, the professional emotional support and the mental health counseling, virtually anyone's going to cover that insurance wise, uh, unless they have an HMO, which means you can only go to their people, which is really kind of crazy when their people won't come to you, but you're a senior living in a senior community, maybe have mobility issues, maybe you don't even own a car, but insurance only cover it if you go to their person. That's not right. But no. for the most part, insurance is going to cover those services. The, unfortunately, the brain fitness stuff is the one that's a little more challenging. If you have dementia, um, most everyone's going to cover our program for it, okay, to try and slow it down, to try and buy you more time. And that's good. And I like that. And I appreciate that. Uh, If you have a mild to moderate cognitive impairment, and it's not dementia, I don't understand why, but the only one covering it is traditional Medicare. But if you have traditional Medicare, No one's probably telling you, you have access to this service. And the cool thing about it is once your deductible for the year is paid, and a lot of people it's paid for by their supplemental insurance anyway, but once their uh, deductible is paid, there's no out-of-pocket 
for us. We don't charge anything additionally. So most of the people using our services are paying nothing for the service. Uh, traditional Medicare is covering it. And it's a great service. And I don't know why the other insurance companies aren't covering it because it's preventative. Yeah, They'll, they'll end up paying way more for mm-hmm. someone that gets dementia than someone who doesn't have it. And we've been very effective at um, preventing dementia and the people. And it's just one piece of what we're doing. You know, we're encouraging them to do all five things. We do hands-on, we do the challenging cognitive activities, but we're encouraging them to do the other four pieces, you know, the eat healthy, eat the right foods, socially engage and exercise, particularly aerobic exercise. You do all five, it's much less likely that you're going to end up with dementia. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I know you've mentioned that you go into senior living communities. Do you go, people who are still in their own homes, do you go to them as well? So the business model, because we are a business, you got to make it work so we can continue Mm -hmm. doing this uh, practice. Business model doesn't work going into individual homes. Then we're sending clinicians traveling all over the place. And that travel time, they're not reimbursed for, but we need to reimburse. The model doesn't work. On the other hand, we have had and still have some clients we're working with that are in their homes, uh, apart from a senior living community. But typically, they live right near a senior living community and are available at the start of the day or the end of the afternoon so that my clinician can either start with them as their first client, then go to the community or go to the community and at the end of the day, go to this house. So that's typically what it is. As far as most people want to know, well, which communities are you in? <laughs> well, okay. So if you're living in a senior living community and you hear this and you want us, uh, the bad news is my clinicians won't come for a single person. This is their career. They make money by doing the actual work. They can't make money by seeing one person. They just can't. So um, we need multiple people in a community, typically eight to 10 people in a community signed up for our services. But there are communities all across Dallas-Fort Worth area right now. We've got them in Dallas, in Denton, in uh, Flower Mound, in Louisville, in Capel and we're expanding all the time. Are you going to expand out of Texas? Um, We have a tentative agreement with a uh, national company that's in eight states, um, Mm -hmm. and we are looking to uh, get that started hopefully in the uh, coming months. We're in negotiations with a um, home health company that wants to do a full-service moving into senior communities and include us as the mental health, brain health piece. Uh, And they're in uh, 43 states, I believe. So we're talking to them. And once they get that set up, it looks like they'll be bringing us in. So uh, our goal is to expand beyond DFW across the state and across the country. Yeah. I mean, it's such an excellent service and so needed. And you don't really hear a lot about brain fitness and about prevention. And I think this is such a great message to spread to people. Yeah, Lori, what I tell you is that, you know, one of the ways it's going to spread, I think, is when people start asking the question of communities, when they're looking for a community is, what are you doing for brain health for my loved one, particularly one-on-one brain health? The answer is for almost everyone's going to be, we don't have anything because they don't, Mm -hmm. because they're not set up to do that. Work-wise, business-wise, they can't serve all those people one-on-one. They're they're taking care of them for so many things, but it's a group thing. It's not a one-on-one thing. So what we're doing is, you know, we're offering that piece to communities where we'll bring in a one-on-one person. They don't even have to, the communities don't even have to pay us to come in. They just need to give us permission. Mm -hmm. They need to give us access to their residents. They need to help us educate them and and get them signed up for it. But when I look at communities, like what's different about these communities? Most of the communities, they don't have a way of separating themselves. You know, if you talk to them, they'll say, well, we're very dedicated staff. Well, they're all saying that. Uh, Our food's excellent. They're all going to say that. We have all these great programming. They're all going to say that. You should come see our beautiful building. They're all going to say that. They're going to say a lot of the same things. But there are only a handful right now that can say, and we have a one-on-one brain fitness program. And that's, you know, in the communities we're in, I always tell people, you need to tell them that. 
you know, because that's very unique, not only in the area, but across the state and across the country. There are a handful of companies doing this work. And I would tell you, there are many, probably more states than not, that have none of this work going on right now. Because it is rare when I talk to a community and I tell them about what we're doing that they go, oh, we already have someone. It's very mm-hmm. rare. It, yeah, you're correct. I don't I don't hear this in many of the communities we work with either. So no. yeah, I think it's it's incredible and I hope that it does continue to spread throughout the country because it's it's important. Well, um, you know, I I've talked to a lot of executive directors, you know, the ones that are running these communities, and the most common comment I get back from them is, Ron, there's no downside that I hear to this, is there? And my answer is always, if there is, they haven't heard it yet. I mean, some other things to know about the program is there are no contracts to sign. So we don't lock them in. They can start, try it out. And if they, it's not for them, they can stop anytime. Um, there's virtually no out of pocket. We don't conflict with any other service that insurance pays for, other than if they're already getting mental health services, we can't see them on the same day. Other than that, there's really no downside. It's just getting these communities to take the time to really hear what we're offering and then support us in educating their residents mm-hmm. to help us get the word out. So if there's enough interest, we can get enough people signed up and then we'll go find them a clinician to go into that community. Yeah, that's great. So well, I, hopefully- me personally, I wish this was in every community. I don't I know do why too. it wouldn't be, but I've talked to a lot of communities that are like, well, we'll think about, and just, it dies. And I've never understood that. (laughs) Yeah, because there really is no downside. So, I mean, it's a win-win. And then if it's an independent living community, you keep brains healthier, you're going to keep your residents longer as well. Yeah, because I, you know, in independent living, there are two things that are typically going to make them move to higher level care. One is their physical health deteriorates, they need more help. There are a ton of of businesses and organizations working with them on that, a ton. But the other thing is, if their brain slows down too much, they can't take care of themselves, they need to move. And there's virtually no one working with them. We're one of the, one of the only ones out there. So yeah, in independent living in particular, uh, I, I think just we're essential. Oh, I completely agree. And, you know, to prevent dementia as best you can, that's, I mean, that's so important. So tell me, moving on to something else, and I always like to ask people this question too, but have, and I know that there's probably a lot of people that have inspired you, but could you tell us inspirational seniors that you've run across either in your personal life or through your work or, or both? We'll limit it to two because okay. there are a ton. I know, right? <laughs> I've, been doing, I've been doing this work with seniors for a little over six years now. So I've come across a ton and and I just love their stories and they're so fascinating. So I'll tell you one of my clients, the one I like to share the most and I got permission to share. So so I always use her. I met a woman who was really just brilliant. I mean, but got married at a young age and started working with a lawyer almost as a secretary, but she was so bright and he figured it out that she started working almost like a paralegal and he won some big case and they're all like, how'd you figure it out? And, you know, how to win it. And and he pointed to her and he always thought she should go to law school, but she was married and, you know, supporting, you know, working with her husband and her husband at one point decided he wanted a cattle ranch. So he buys a cattle ranch and then he decides He's not interested in working it. So she runs the cattle ranch. Oh so this gosh. is, think <laughs> of the time period we're talking about, right? A female cattle rancher. <laughs> and she led a very successful cattle ranch for a long time. And then she started writing stories for the Cattle Ranch Association. And she really liked it. So she wanted to take a class in writing. So her husband said, well, if you're going to take a class, uh, why don't you just go back to school? And so she went to college and she got an undergrad degree. And then she really liked that. And he encouraged her. So she got a master's and she really liked that. And he encouraged her and she got a PhD and she became a professor. She became a world renowned expert on these historical areas like a Texas history museum or Mm -hmm. whatever county museum. And she became an expert on this. So it always fascinated me that she was so diverse and just so fascinating to me. 
So that's that's my favorite one I like to talk about with my clients. The other one is my mother-in-law. Mm-hmm. Anyone that knows my mother-in-law would figure I'm going to pick her. She's fabulous. And I have the greatest mother-in-law in the world, by the way. And she was a teacher. And then she, when she moved to Dallas, she got involved in an organization called Jewish Family Service. And she really liked it. And they didn't have someone organizing their volunteers. So she was, she set up the first volunteer coordinator position. She became the first one of that, really grew the position, started some different programs. There were a lot of Russian immigrants moving into the area. And she started a bilingual program teaching them the language. And she became integral for that and started up a bunch of other programs. And she's just been always very good at connecting people mm-hmm. and getting them what they need and, and, and being very giving and outwardly giving as well as an uh, unbelievable matron of the family and, and connecting everyone within the family. Always adored her and still do. And actually we're moving next door to her in the, in the, in the next year. So uh, just oh, so we can, cool. we live three blocks and it's just too far. So we're going to move next door. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's perfect. <laughs> yes. Well, great. Those are great stories. I, I love that. And I really am, I, I love what you're doing. And I'm happy that we can share this with more people. And if someone wants to contact you, I know your website's not set up yet, but what's the best way to contact you? And we'll put this you know, out there as well on the podcast. Yeah, so I need to explain. So Enlighten is the company itself is like brand new. We just mm-hmm. got started, but we're an offshoot of an offshoot of a company that doesn't even exist anymore that was around for like 18 years. So we're, we, while Enlighten is new, the people running Enlighten have been around for six years. So the program itself isn't new. We're just another offshoot of it. That's why we don't have the website. It'll be up soon, hopefully. It'll probably be enlightenedseniorcare.com, most likely. Just look for Enlightened Senior Care. But if they want to reach out to me, um, particularly if they want to introduce me to an executive director or a director of nursing or a wellness director in a senior community or someone that's on that executive team in a senior community, that's ideal. That's where I can start the conversations with them. Uh, have them reach out to me. My email address is rnevelo. That's R-N-E, V as in Victor, E-L-O-W, at Enlighten, that's E-N-L-I-G-H-T-E-N, dot hush, H-U-S-H, dot com. So rnevelo at Enlighten, dot hush, dot com. Or easier, if you're writing things down, it's just my phone number. Call and leave me a message. My number is 214-563-2120. Two six. That's two one four five six three two one two six. Leave me a message because I don't answer for anyone that I don't know who it is. Leave a message and I will get back in touch with you. But I love talking to people. Love the opportunity to educate them. And you know, I tell people all the time, I don't do any sales. I'm I'm in charge of business development for Enlighten, but. My job, I don't look at it as sales. My, my job is to educate. That's what I do. If I talk to an administrative team in a senior community and I educate them about what we do and they're still not on board, it's not the right place. If I go into a community and educate them about brain health and they're convinced they don't need it, then that's not the community for us. But I have to believe there are people that when they understand that there are five things you need to be doing and they're not, these communities aren't doing one of them and we can do it for them that they're going to want us and that hopefully the seniors are going to want us. And the ones that already have dementia, the caregivers for them need to take care of them and get them connected to us. Because while we can't stop it, they're pretty effective at slowing it down and easing different behavior issues. Because what we're finding also in assisted living and memory care communities is a lot of them, the behavior issues have to do with them feeling like they're not being heard. They're just being pushed and told what to do. And, and ignored because, again, you can't do one-on-one work in these communities. But we come in twice a week, every week, spend about a little under an hour with them, talking to them, doing different activities with them. They start to feel heard. And when they do, we find the behavior issues start to go away with a lot of them. That's why a lot of assisted living communities um, really like us. Mm-hmm. Because we're coming in to do brain work. And before you know it, the behavior issues start going away with some of these people. And that's great. And uh, Mm -hmm. it's real easy to get us 
uh, connected to them too. Good. You know, I think the other thing, and, and this has come up several times in this past week, is having a sense of purpose. And I feel that a lot of people, they say that I don't really have a purpose anymore. They may have some dementia, but this also gives them a purpose. If they're learning a new language, if they're learning a new skill, that is a purpose. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things, particularly when dealing with dementia, with dementia, we're really going to focus um, on helping them hold on to their words because they're going to lose their words. Uh, mm-hmm. recognizing people, name, face, recognition of the people they know, and then holding on to long, positive long-term memories. It's really focused on those three things because those are the most important things. So a lot of the games and activities that I talk about is really the mild to moderate program. But mm-hmm. with people with dementia, it's about helping them hold on to stuff because their families, and I totally understand, I used to do this too, just assume that their grandmother is going to remember that trip they took or the funny story mm-hmm. they've told for decades. And the reality is, unless they're thinking of that over and over again, not, they're going to lose it and they're going to lose it quick. You better mm-hmm. hold on to it because dementia eventually is going to take it all from them if they live long enough anyway. That's inevitable. And until we find a cure for it, it's inevitable. It's a progressive illness, right? Whatever form of dementia they have, it's, it's a progressive illness. But you can slow it down by working on these things. And that's so important for them. And that's what we're trying to do with them. Because Absolutely. if I can buy an extra year of them recognizing their daughter or son, it's huge mm-hmm. to them. And as I often tell people, some people is like, well, what if it doesn't work? And I'm like, well, let's look at it that way. Even if it didn't work, and I got a ton of people through six years that would claim it does, even if it didn't work, if Medicare or your insurance company would pay to have someone visit your loved one twice a week and spend quality time with them one-on-one for a little over an hour, do you want that? Who would say no to that? Exactly. Of course you want that. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing to lose and, and much to gain by doing this. No so. downside to what we're offering. It really isn't. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Ron. I appreciate you being on and sharing all this with us. I I hope people have been taking notes and uh, wrote the five things down. I know I am going to be um, doing all those five things because I don't I don't want dementia. My grandmother had it and saw what that was like. So I, I don't think any yeah. of us want that. So we'll do whatever we can to prevent it. But thank you so much. I appreciate you being on and we'll have all your information as well so people can reach you if they want to bring this into their community. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me, Lori. Anytime. Absolutely. All right. We'll see y'all next week. Bye-bye.